Okay, welcome everyone. Today, uh, we are going to continue on the Zhuangzi's uh, inner chapter, um, the equality of things. And I have mentioned, okay, this chapter is the most difficult one and usually being considered as a hurdle to read uh, Zhuangzi. So if you go through this one and the, you will find out the rest will become much easier. So I was planned to finish last week, but turned out I can't because it's really too long and a lot of things to do. So today I'm going to spend probably first 30 minutes to go through the uh, what we did last week and then we can uh, finish this one for sure. I guarantee we will finish uh, uh, today's uh, chapter. Okay, so I uh, believe everyone can see my screen and then, uh, so that's the schedule, a little bit change. Last week we talked about chapter two and this week we will focus on the second part of chapter two and then uh, second part of the chapter two. And then next week, Kwang is going to, we're going to change our mind a little bit. Next week, we are going to talk about Mencius and the focus Mencius as a politician, state counselor, counselor and the philosopher. Okay, so Kwang is going to uh, talk about uh, uh, Mencius. And you will see it's a good contrast compared to today's uh, philosophy. And then we move on to the end of May, uh, SK going to talk about Bhagavad Gita. And this time he's going to review the first third of uh, Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so uh, it's about the uh, uh, comma, I think the first part. Okay, so, and then uh, on the next, hold on. On the uh, beginning of June, we are going to continue on the chapter three. And if you have been here long, you probably know I go through the history of the Chinese philosophy from the author Feng Yulan, is the author. And then uh, I finished the book. And then right now I have three books I try to finish for the rest of the year. The first is the Feng Yulan's writing about the Zhuangzi, his translation, his commentary. And another book is called The Spirit of the Chinese Philosophy. He put the 10 subjects of that and they go one by one. I probably can go through this one. Another one is a six classic Chinese novel. So uh, I will try to uh, go through these uh, three books for the rest of the year. So let's uh, go to today's subject. So we are going to on the uh, chapter two, which is the equality on the equality of things. And I'm going to focus on the butterfly dream, uh, which is on the very end of this chapter. I will assume most of people know uh, what's the butterfly dream talk about uh, and what's that meaning. Is anybody want to give your thought or your understanding about the Zhuangzi's butterfly dream? If any volunteer want to talk about this. Oh, Fred, thank you. Well, it's the classic uh, dilemma that if you're if you dream that you're a butterfly fluttering around and you wake up, then the question is, are you a, a man who's dreamed that you're a butterfly or are you a butterfly who is dreamed, dreaming that you're a man? That's the, the, the gist of it. Okay, thank you, Fred. Okay. Uh... Okay, then I, I, I think we will see this one and then I hope uh, you will share your uh, opinion at the end. Is any different uh, than you thought now? Because uh, according to uh, Fred, this one is a traditional classical uh, dilemma or paradox. When you wake up, you don't know you are dreaming or 
you, you just wake up or you are still dreaming. I think that's the dilemma usually people face. But uh, uh, Zhuangzi put this one in a very, very long chapter and they put it in the very end. Then we will see what's going on, you know, why he do this one. I had been thinking this question for a long time. Why this, this uh, uh, so-called uh, dilemma and he put it at the end and put this heavy chapter and at the very end. So that's the chapter two. So I'm going to, uh, I, I talked about this one. Okay, so I'm going quickly through the structure of the chapter two I've mentioned last week. And then uh, let me uh, talk again, which is not every uh, reader read this way. And I think this way makes sense. It is makes sense to me. So that whole chapter, I break it down to full dialogue and the plus the end is butterfly dream. So I think this one is kind of like a platonic dialogue on each one, okay? So they have the question teacher and the student, the question and the answer. And end with very long speech from Socrates. Okay, this kind of format. So especially on the dialogue one, and that's the most difficult one. And I have been go through on that, and today I'm going through again, but I'm not. I'm going to focus on different things since uh, they have a lot of uh, Zhuangzi or Taoism theory. Okay, uh, some theoretical foundation in this dialogue. So I'm going to skip uh, the example, story, you know, mythology on the dialogue one. I'm going to uh, just treat this one as an essay. And they have the, some uh, important uh, concept here. So that would be the first one, probably occupy two thirds of the whole dialogue. Then they have the second dialogue, that when you finish this dialogue, then go to the second dialogue, which is person called Nie Chue and Wang Ni. Okay, and I, I, I like to use my own different translation. I call it the toothless guy and the toddler kid, the conversation. Then go to the third dialogue. It's between so-called Ju Chue and the Chang Wu Zi, sounds like a Taoist master conversation, but if you dissect the name, it means the megapod, the bird talk to the twig, okay? So, and then the last one is the shadow talk to the uh, 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 penumbra, okay? So the, the very short conversation. Then we go to the butterfly dream. Okay. So that's the whole structure on that, and then uh, so first part, let's go to the uh, very beginning of uh, dialogue, right? Let's start with the Nan Guo, uh, Nan Guo Zi Qi. Okay, he's the Taoist master. Just assume he's the Taoist master. <laughs> Set it in on the table and he look at heaven and the breathe gently and seemingly to be in a trance and unconscious of his body, right? And Yan Chengzi, who is his disciple and who was attending on him, say, what is this? Can the body become this like dry wood and the mind like dead ashes? The man living on the table is not he who was there before. Right. So that's the opening. Okay. So the uh, the teacher start to talk about Yan, okay. Uh, your question is very good, but just he said, I lost myself. Okay, he lost yourself. Okay, we want to know why. Then he talked about, do you understand? You may have heard the music of man, music of earth, and have you heard the music of heaven? So that's all the conversation talk about music. And last week we talked about when he used the word, I train, Feng Yulan translate as lie, uh, lie. Okay, in general means music, but it also means any sound, piping, some voice coming out. So that's the starting point. So I'm not going to the detail about the dialogue, but I'm going to uh, abstract this dialogue to make it as uh, some scene, important scene in this, this dialogue. So this long dialogue, and we can treat them as an essay and talking about some 
uh, key concept in this chapter and which also serves the foundation for the entire Taoism, uh, Taoism philosophy. Okay, so first thing we talk about knowledge, epistemology question, which talk about the great and uh, the small, the small uh, knowledge, and he called the great knowledge and the small knowledge. And the second thing, talk about the concept of oneness, talk about important thing is two causes in one, okay? So then he talked about the reason. I think some translation called reason, and then since he called it meaning, so that means the light of reason. I find out we probably. I find out we probably can call it like fiat uh, box. Okay, probably another way to call it. So, okay, and the last one I think is important. It's uh, talking about the preserva uh, preservation of enlightenment. Yes, we all know enlightenment and the Zhuangzi will take one step further, how to preserve this enlightenment. So actually this one turned to his moral teaching and then we will compare with next week when we talk about uh, Mencius, when Mencius talk about uh, uh, when Mencius talk about the uh, moral and the, how he deal with that. That's what I need. Uh, Jason, I don't know if you know you lost your sound. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, you're back. Okay, sorry. There's an echo, but we can hear you. Okay, it's okay right now? Perfect. Okay. Okay, sorry about this. I think some interruption here. You uh, lost maybe... it uh, just when you were saying mentious moral something. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me go back here. Okay, so uh, one thing we will talk about is about the moral teaching. And then next week, there's a good to comparison with next week uh, when we talk about mentions. That's a, of course, if you go to Confucian, it's a mentions. Everything is about moral teaching. But uh, the, unlike uh, Confucius, okay, Zhuangzi or Taoism usually talk about many, many things, then you drop, then he drops. The, uh, what you want to teach morally. Okay. So I think that would be the different and that would be good to compare. So first part of the uh, dialogue, dialogue one, okay. Zhuangzi want to talk about the uh, knowledge and he called the great knowledge and the smaller knowledge. Okay. So you will see, I just put all the, uh, most of the text here, but uh, uh, I, I'm not going to go all the detail, it will be too long. And I just uh, point out some key point. So here, after the, they talk about the music of man, music of the earth and music of the heaven, he, re, he shift his conversation to knowledge, okay? The point is the, 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 the music or the sound actually is language and the knowledge actually defined by the language. Okay, I think that's the, the, the assumption here. So here he start with great knowledge is wide and comprehensive. 
Small knowledge is partial and restricted. Great speech is rich and powerful. Small speech is merely so much talk. When people sleep, there is confusion of soul. When awake, there is movement of body. So basically, he set the tone for the entire chapter. You want to talk about knowledge, talk about language, talk about dream and awake. And then he has a long discussion. He described all different kind of mental state, or you want to call it psychology. So that's the his first part of conversation. Remember the Nan Guo Ziqi, who is the Taoist uh, uh, master. Then second subject he talking about. Uh, second subject he start to move is talking about oneness. So we would like to be a little bit careful about the so-called oneness. His one is a little bit different, have subtle different than when uh, Confucian talk about one. Okay. So the possible is possible. The impossible is impossible. The Tao makes things and they are what they, and the Tao makes things and they are what they are. And then, blah, 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 then to the end, he talk about all this by means of the Tao are united and become one. So here he he talking about the being, uh, the beautiful and the ugly. They are the one. Okay. So um, I skip some part, but uh, basics. A lot of example. He's talking about the truth and the force. Right. That's when we use Tao, we may think about truth and the force. But in Zhuangzi or Taoism point of view, the truth and the force is just the position you take. Same as when you speak, you involve in argument or dialect, okay? You are talking about right and the wrong. And that also depend on the position you stand. And here he used another example, the beautiful girl, and the ugly girl here, he talk about Li Yu Xi Si. It's just by the standard you look at. Okay, so he here he talk about uh, all these means of the Tao are united and become one. And actually, I that's the uh, Feng Yulan's translation in Tao in uh, Chinese it's called Tao Tong Wei Yi. Um, I think the better way in my understanding would be all these by means of Tao are connected as one. And actually I don't see it's united because Tong means they are connected, but not necessarily uh, combined together as one. Okay, that's my understanding by this. And uh, so uh, you may, we may not see this one as obvious or something, uh, 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 significant, but if you look at uh, Plato's dialogue, right? If you talk about symposium, talk about beauty, actually talk about love, but uh, Socrates talk about beauty, right? Or in the another mind, another dialogue called Hippias, right? Hippias Major talk about the beauty. So when Plato or Socrates see a beautiful thing. He wants to separate the beautiful thing and the beauty itself. He wants to talk about some, he don't want to talk about his beauty, this dog is beauty, the weather, the, the, the scene is beauty, the, uh, the building is beauty. He wants to talk about the form of beauty, which is beauty itself. So I talk about Plato, right? Turn out that he, his development is become a form or idea, or you want to call it the idols. In the Zhuangzi face the same situation, he go to the opposite direction. He talk about, he talk about Zhuangzi, want to talk about when he see the beautiful thing, he want to see they are also something not beautiful or ugly. And they, they just have a different standard because, you know, we can see, right? When we see the uh, older picture, they say, oh, she's beauty. But actually in our point of view, it may not be feel beauty because 
you know, that's a different standard. So in Zhuangzi's point of view is the beauty, beautiful and the ugly, just a different point of view. So turn out that instead of go to platonic form, Zhuangzi go to the other direction, he go everything a style, okay? So I think that's the key difference if you want to compare uh, Taoism and uh, uh, Western philosophy or you want to call it the uh, platonic idea. That's the key separate. And uh, I think that's a good comparison because they happen almost in the same time in the history, right? So that's one thing he talked about the uh, uh, so-called oneness, okay? Which I believe is a little bit different than uh, what the Confucius or the uh, Confucianism talk about uh, oneness. If you talk about one, okay, so I think this one had the better uh, interpretation about one. Basically, he talked about two causes at once. Okay, so uh, Fei Wu, you have a, a question or comment, please? Uh, yes, Jason, can you please explain how did how Confucius talked about a one or one? Okay, Thank we you. can if you talk about one, he talked about united. So, for example, he talked about great union, da dao. Okay, so great. Great unity. Okay, so that's Confucius uh, utopia. So Confucius was thinking about the great society is just like ancient time. Everything is one. So during this utopian society, every, everything will be taken care of. Okay. And they have the one uh, moral standard that people will follow, okay, which is Confucian's morality. Okay? So that, that's the key difference as one. So some people see difference as the natural way to go, and some people see united is the natural way to go. I think that's a, that would be the key, key difference. So, I, so here will be a bit clear um, uh, explanation of uh, uh, Zhuangzi talking about one, which the one is the two cores at once. So <clears throat> the, uh, we talk about this story and it's a short story and the, the monkey, the zookeeper or monkey, uh, the person who has a monkey and then he gives the monkey three uh, acorn in the morning and the seven at uh, afternoon. And the monkey complained, okay, blah, blah, blah. And then the, the, keep, the zookeeper said, <coughs> okay, I'll give you four in the morning, three in the afternoon. And the monkey is happy, okay. So what's the difference? They all get the seven at daytime. So here, okay, it's different than what you, our understanding, today's understanding. The Zhuangzi want to talk about is he called Liang Hang, two causes at once. Basics is no difference. Okay. So what is right? He talked about okay. So here the translation here read as therefore the sage. Sage he talked about thousand sage harmonize the system of the right and the wrong and the rest, the revolution of nature. This is called following two causes at one. So I put my own explanation here because I think this English word probably too confusion concept. Okay. Because I I I don't see it's a harmonized okay right and the wrong. I see more on the not distinguish right and the wrong, have the right and the wrong, wrong running at the same time. So uh, that's the, my, but of course you might have, you might have your own uh, thinking on this word. I just want to present the text here. And the important is here, 
uh, Folio Land have the, uh, uh, his comment on this. He said, uh, from here, right? He said, just that the different opinions alone and the do not dispute or interfere with them. They do not abolish the difference a different opinion. They just transcend them. This is called the following two causes at once. Uh, I like this explanation. I think so he, he explained the concept of so-called two course at once in Chinese called Yanghang. And I read this one for, well, I know this word for a long time. And then I've been uh, puzzled by what's the meaning of the, uh, this one called uh, Yanghang until I see Feng Yulan's translation called two courses at once. I think that makes sense to the uh, Zhuangzi's concept on that. Okay. So another thing important is talking about uh, in his word, I think he put this one twice in the text. So that means it's important. In Chinese called Mo Ru Yi Ming. So you can say Yi Ming. So um, Feng Yulan's translation, which is a common, considered Ming as reason, because, but again, uh, so-called reason is a little bit different. There sometimes you may think about things more like a principle, but uh, I like to put here is the light because it's more like a light. So he's talking about how to deal with these two different opinions. So uh, in uh, Zhuangzi's idea, he talked about use the light of reason. And it's in Chinese called yi ming, ming means bright. So I think the good English concept could be fiat lux, okay, in the Bible, that there'll be light, just that there'll be light, forget about other things, all right. Uh, Mother, please. Yes, um, in the Chinese, does it does it use a word comparable to reason? Okay, but I think even in English, right, the reason is a very confused uh, words. Even in tend tend right uh, critique of pure reason and the practical reason, mm -hmm. each book is eight hundred pages. So. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I will say uh, it's, it's also not right to say Chinese have no reason. Okay, so that's also wrong. Okay, but here we use the word "ming." Okay, "ming" means sun and the moon, which is understanding. But he used another word called "yi," meaning by this way. So uh, I was, uh, I think, the Feng Yulan as a Western trained philosopher he would directly think about its reason and the light, which also uh, Western concept. Okay. Uh, so I think that if you ask what's the word of the reason and another word called the, if you remember in the uh, 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 Neo-Confucian uh, discussion about Zhu Xi, okay, that is on the 13th century. Okay. Chinese Confucian scholars start, start to use the word di, which means reason in today's sense. And then another way I will look at it is a principle. And I like the translation called the universal principle. And sometimes people put the capital R, the reason, which would be similar to Hegelian concept of reason. That means the reason is not in your heart. The reason is outside your universal reason. It's heavenly reason. So uh, I hope I don't make it confused. Okay. Basics, that's the okay. situation, yeah. Great, so, thank you. Um, okay. Reason looks like, um, I like understanding better. And I also like the idea of the sun moon. Okay. There is a part, um, I think it's in this, where the sage stands next to the sun and the moon yeah. or tucks yeah. them under his arm. Yeah. Um, so I like that, and it goes very well with light. Um, the thing about reason, it tends to imply 
intellect. And then the first thing I think of is, well, if you're trying to tell true and false, right and wrong, eloquence, now you're using a finger to define a not finger or a horse to define a not horse. Uh, if I, you're using reason for those things. Actually, in this point, I really, I agree with you. And the data we will talk about uh, Feng Yolan, he talk about William James, okay? Uh, William James talk about the pure experience, okay? So which seems reject to use reason? And the Feng Yolan's point is uh, it's to the limit of epistemological understanding. You should go to the mysticism, okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, I, I think you are, uh, in this moment, in this point of view, I totally agree with you, Madam. Okay, on this one. So that's why I pick these words. I think, you know, fiat lux, okay? Let they be light, probably close to what uh, Zhuangzi means, mo ruo yi min. And the data he will further define, okay? Uh, what does he mean, moral yi ming? Okay, this word. Okay. Uh, Fred, please. You had mentioned a universal principle. Yeah. And, and as I recall, some time ago, we had talked about qi as a universal principle or vital force of life. Is there a correlation between the two? Uh, okay, put it this way. Okay. Uh, in Chinese concept of qi is a material. Okay, so in Zhu Xi, okay, there's a two school here. One we can call Qi school, we, we, another we can call principle school. Right, right now we, we talk about uh, Confucianism in the 13th century, okay? We are not talking about Zhuangzi. Two school, one called Qi school, one called principle school. Qi school is talking about you have a Qi, which is material, but you is intangible material stuff called qi, which has a moral sense. So you act, you cultivate your qi, you will become a righteous person, good person on this one. That's the qi school talking about. And the principles, uh, the principle school, or you want to call it the universal principle will say, whatever qi is doing, it's follow the principle, then it's good. If you don't follow the principle, it's bad. And where is the principle coming from? It's not from you, from the person. It's heavenly principle. And make another example would be a multi multiplication table, okay? It exists before you know the number because it's there and people just find the number. Then, oh, they have the multiplication nine times nine equal to 81. So that's the heavenly principle. It's not there. And take more extreme. Chinese Confucian like to talk about is the xiao, the filial piety, how to treat your parent, right? So before human exists, the xiao, the filial piety already exists, the heavenly, okay? So when people were born and they have a son, they have a father, they have a mother, they have a daughter, then they just follow the heavenly relation. It's not you decide, it's heavenly. So I think that's the difference, okay? Good. I'll take you the distinction. You you got a dis distinction? No, I said thanks for the distinction. Oh, thanks. okay, okay. I hope it's not okay. Uh, we will have a chance to talk about this this one. And Kari, please. Uh, quickly, I'm trying to think of a Western term that might encapsulate that. And nature comes to mind. Maybe psychologically, what people think is natural um, or follows a sequence versus something supernatural or, or uh... You talk about reason or talk about... Well, the difference between principle and the, the righteous person, the, the she... Oh, oh okay, um, okay. Versus the okay. heavenly principle, yeah. Yeah, Is yeah, that... thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's another way to look at, you know. Uh, 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 that, that's back to Zhuangzi's discuss, discussion on this one. And then here, and I think I put in the blue, that means the Feng Yolan, the common, right? So he said that all distinction of right and the wrong are due to opinion, which is from the Zhuangzi's writing. 
okay, that which can be revealed, the falsity of, of opinion is reason. Okay, so I think this one is a little bit confusing because we may say we use reason to determine, right? So, and the reason see things in the light of heaven and knows that the system of right and the wrong are human judgment have nothing to do with nature. To see this is the very essence of Tao. That's what Feng Yulan's talking about. Uh, the, the reason, human reason, just no right and the wrong and which is not nature, is not Tao. And then I think next one, we will have a better uh, understanding because in Zhuangzi's writing, he talking about this twice. And this one will tie to Laozi, Dao De Jing, uh, uh, is talking about. So um, this one is a little bit long and uh, like tongue twister. If you read in Chinese, it's like, <laughs> uh, it's difficult, even difficult to read. And I think English probably also difficult, but it's really like everything is that and everything is this. Since do not know that, that they are another that, they only know they are this. So important he's talking about that and the this, this, right? They just on the different position, you will say that and this. And then uh, if you take the other side, you say that and this. And I think that's a common uh, understanding. He starts from this point. So, he said the, the that and the, the this produce each other. So why we have that? Because you have this, right? I think that's the point. It's relative. If you don't have a concept of that, then you don't have a concept of this. So here's, here is going to, there is life and there is death, right? And there is death, then there is life. Okay. And here I'd like to point out is, uh, since Chinese word doesn't have be verb, so uh, to express the being and the non-being, uh, sometimes in, for example, in uh, Lao Zi's Dao De Jing, we use you and Wu, okay? Have and uh, have not to represent being and non-being. And then in Zhuangzi, I find out, you know, a lot of time when he talk about life and the death, he probably talk about being and the non-being, this kind of, very classical concept in uh, Western philosophy. So uh, let's jump to the conclusion here. He talked about only the essence, okay? And the, the, so he wanted us to stand in the center of the circle responding to the endless change. This world have endless change. He talked about they have the death, then that is this. If you have a concept of being, then you have a concept of non-being. And he talked about if you have a concept of possible, then you have the concept of impossible. If you have a concept of right, then you have a concept of wrong. So Zhuangzi here, he want to say, you want to, his solution will be stand at the center of circle and responding to the endless change. It back to the previous uh, slide that we talked about, uh, Two courses at once, right? It's that two line, right and the wrong, beautiful and ugly, wrong together, and you just stay in between. And I think it's in the next chapter, uh, I mean, uh, next chapter, chapter three, you have a, a little bit more clear on that. So he continued talking about uh, the, the right is an end of the the right is an endless change, the wrong also an endless change. Therefore, it is said there is nothing better than the use of light of reason, which he talked about more rule he mean the light of reason. That's why he want to talk about our attitude, okay? Set standing in the center and the, 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 don't make it a, 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 a judgment on that. So, uh, here I'd like to refer to the uh, Dao De Jing, okay, which is from Lao Zi, uh, a couple hundred years before Zhuangzi, apparently talk about the same thing on the chapter two, right? Uh, Lao Zi talk about when the people of the world know what makes the beautiful beautiful, the concept of ugly arise, 
when they know what makes the good good, the concept of evil arise. So why this world have some ugly thing? Because you say something is beautiful. Why this one have this world have evil? Because you say something as good, then they have evil. So he talk about why why like this. Everything have the same same situation. You have the being, then you have the non-being. You have something difficult, then something will be easy. You have something long, you have something short. You have super, superiority, then you have the inferiority. You have the music, then non-music, you say that's noise. So you have something, you know, you say, okay, my face is front, then my school is my back. But if you say this one is front, uh, because you have the front, then you have the back. So everything is relative, and that's the continue from the uh, 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 Lao Zi's teaching, and then Zhuang Zi start to continue. And according to this text, Zhuang Zi's chapter, right, you just have enlightenment or you have the light of reason is not enough. So he want to go to go even further. Okay, he want to talk about the moral teach on that. So it also come with another long paragraph. So I start to dissect to uh, a few things, so it will be easier to read. Okay, I have to admit this part of text is very difficult to read because it's very dense and put a lot of text together. So uh, I kind of uh, separate them. So I hope it will be easier to read. First, he talk about they have the eight uh, predicable. Okay, he called eight predicable. So he says everything left, then you have to write. If you start a discussion, then you have the judgment because you need to draw the conclusion. You start to divide things, then you have an argument. And then you start to emulate emulation, then you start to compete or contentions come in. So all these things happen, okay, because you start to do something. So here he talk about the what is beyond this world. The say, uh, do not deny its existence. Uh, so that means the sage agree. There's a something beyond this world, but sage doesn't talk about this. Okay? He doesn't want to talk about beyond this world. And we see in this world, the sage will discuss it, but you will not make judgment. And what in the history and then ancient kings, the sage just passed the judgment. Okay, that's the right thing, that's the wrong thing, that's it. And but don't want to argue, just say, oh, that's right, that's wrong. And that's people do this, people don't do this, that's it. So that's uh, Zhuang Zi's attitude to everything happen. Then he come with uh, five moral teaching, let's put it this way, okay? So when there is a division, there's something not divided, right? When there are an argument, there's something which the argument cannot reach. So right now you can see he start to push, we call the, in the Western concept, the reason, rationality to the limit, right? How is that? The sage embrace all while men in general argue about them in order to convince each other. So we regular people argue each other, try to get who is right, who is wrong, but sage, Right. Here, talk about sages, thousand sages will embrace all. Okay, so he comes with four moral lessons Talk about great doubt does not admit of being spoken. Great argument does not require words. The great benevolence, which is run, very typical uh, Confucian word, is not purposely charitable. Okay, the great purity is not purposely modest or purposely humble. The great courage is not purposely violent. I think the better way to translate is Ji is aggressive. The courage not means uh, aggressive. Then he's reversed it, okay? Talk about Tao, that display is not Tao. And the speech that argue, okay, uh, uh, fails uh, short of its end, right? And the Ren, the benevolence that is constantly exercised does not accomplish its object. The pure, okay, the purity, right, if uh, openly possessed is not uh, uh, incredulity, in incredulity, right? So I think this why sometimes 
it's hard to get it, but my understanding and which I, what I believe, if you see somebody are so clean, sometimes you don't trust this kind of person. I don't know if you have this kind of experience or not, but I do see this way, okay? Um, because if you too pure, too clean, too uh, unreally clean, okay? Never get dirty and only speak virtue, that kind of person I feel not trustworthy. Okay, that could be just my own experience, but that's what uh, Zhuangzi is talking about. And talk about the great courage is purpose. Uh, the great courage, which is, that is purposely uh, aggressive, will be failed. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Then he draw, mm -hmm. therefore, he who knows to, okay, three important concepts he wants to talk about here. Okay, he talk about what is perfect, what's the store of nature, and what's the preservation of enlightenment. So he talk about he who knows to stop at what he does not know is perfect. Okay, so you will see this one, the concept perfect is very different than Confucius perfect, right? Or a lot of people's perfect, perfect is keep pursuing better and better. And then Zhuangzi here, he talked about, you should stop at where you doesn't know, you don't know. And then next chapter, we'll have more opening, we'll start from this one, okay? And then he who knows the argument that require no word and the Tao cannot be named is called the store of nature, all right? The store, which is the store of nature, when things are put in, it is not full. When things are taken out, it's not empty. And he himself does not know why it is so. This one is called the preservation of enlightenment. So that's the three things uh, Zhuangzi is talking about. Okay. But it's interesting, we will see it's continue, it's a uh, very similar to. Uh, Dao De Jing, chapter one, the opening, and most of people probably read this one already. So the Tao, which can be Tao or which can be expressed, is not the unchanging Tao or the great Tao or real Tao, right? The name which can be named is not the unchanging name or you want to call it the great name, the real name. So he, you hear he tied to a, detail, a more detailed explanation of what Dao De Jing is talking about on the opening. Uh, Madeline, please. Yes, I am remembering uh, in Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu, yeah. uh, in chapter eight, mm -hmm. there was a discussion of uh, five, five qualities that are dangerous in a commander. Yeah. Was one of them um, the, the purity that you had on the previous slide? It was some sort of, was that the same meaning? Well, okay. Yeah, you can say it's the same meaning, but you can, but I think, well, we can say, uh, okay, let's put it this way. Okay. Uh, they had the same meaning, but in the different uh, level. I, that's my opinion. I think the here, the purity, he's talking about more on the philosophical. Devil. In the Sunzi, he talk about purity, right? Because you are too pure. Eh, you care about your name, right? So he is talking about utilitarian reason because you will lose the war. I think that's the difference, right? Okay, thanks. But the same word, you are right, okay. So one thing I'd like to compare, which you kind of lead to next week's discussion when Quan come here to talk about uh, mentions, okay? So you can compare, well, how does mentions talk about four seeds, right? He talk about run, he talk about which is benevolent, talk about righteous, talk about the richer, talk about the wisdom. And later on in the neo uh, Confucian also at the trustworthy. Uh, he is not talking about, in their point of view, that have a proper way to do it, to be perfect, not like in 
Zhuangzi's token is kind of uh, stay in between. Okay, so something I think last week we talked about the usefulness. So the real usefulness is in the daily use. Okay, it's hidden. It's not really shown. Okay, that's the right attitude according to uh, Taoism teaching. So we will end the uh, dialogue one with this long uh, comment from Feng Yulan. Uh, he talked about, uh, so here, uh, Feng Yulan make an interesting comment. And then he talking about Zhuangzi's teaching here. He related to William James, uh, uh, his writing. Uh, in uh, radical empiricism, I, I I I didn't read this one, so I have I don't know about this one. I only know William James talk about the tough-minded and uh, gentle-minded, and when he talk about tough-minded, he's talking about the British uh, empiricism. When he talk about tender-minded, he talking about the uh, uh, European the continental rationalism, and then. Uh, uh, in the British side, so-called the tough-minded is focused on the subject. And then in the European uh, uh, rationalism is talking about the object. So this subject-object dialectical relationship has been the uh, 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 perennial discussion in the Western tradition. And then uh, uh, in this case, you know, uh, 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 William James, he was uh, Harvard professor on the psychology, okay, and the turn into philosophy. He wanted to put the subject object together, and then his idea he called himself the radical empiricism. Basics, his idea is when we know they have a distinction because the subject object distinction is on the ontological level. And the, the, uh, in the epistemological level, there's no distinction. It's only had a pure experience. That's what I, my understanding about uh, this concept of uh, a pure, experience. But I do read another writing, which is similar to this kind of thing, is art as experience, which is by Zhang Dui. He talked about each art is a, it's an experience. Okay, That's Zhang Dui. I, I see the similarity here. So here, how does this concept tie to Zhuangzi uh, 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 teaching on this part? According to Feng Yulan, okay, in this paragraph, Zhuangzi gradually passed the discussion of rational knowledge of the non-distinction of right and the wrong to that of mystical experience of the union of individual with the whole. This union is attached in the world of pure experience. That's uh, William James' term. Okay, so I think that here he used the word the mysticism. And I feel probably a little bit uh, misleading here because in the Western tradition, when we talk about rationality or reason, we push to certain limit, we will talk about they have the jump and that's the face, uh, that's the uh, mysticism. And when the Western uh, tradition, when we talk about mystery about a lot of times since the Christian tradition, we will associate with revelation, Faith, uh, God's grace, or depend on which school you are thinking, but basics, that's the in the Western side. But on the Chinese philosophy, since there's no Plato's ideas of form, idea of form or idols, eight, 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 uh, uh, so that's different when we talk about mysticism. I think that's why, you know. Data it did to the dream and awake. Okay, so one way to look at it is this mysticism in Western tradition. We will talk about revelation, God's grace, and your face, this kind of thing. 
but in the Chinese tradition, it become or oh, even in the Indian tradition, will go to the Brahman. Okay, so you, your consciousness back in the back. So I think so that's the uh, we will conclude uh, dialogue one here. It's a long dialogue, but the rest will be much shorter. Then we can move on to the second part. Okay. So I will stop for minutes if you have a question or anything you want to share on the first part. So remember, uh, in my partition, okay, I read this whole chapter, chapter two, equality on the equality of things. I read it as to this moment. It's the dialogue between uh, Nan Guo Zi and the Yan Cheng Zi, the teacher and the student, but end with a long teaching from the teacher. Okay, so it ends here. And then Zhuang Zi ready to move to the second dialogue. So before I move to the second dialogue, uh, I will uh, stop here for a minute. If you have a question, comment, or anything. No comment? Okay, I hope everything is fine. So, uh, uh, so I think the rest of the conversation, the dialogue will be, uh, I would say, uh, easier and uh, then more fun on that. Okay. Let's move on, okay, for the second dialogue. So, so-called the uh, Nie Chue and Wang Yi. If you look at the words, okay, Nie Chue means, Nie means your teeth. Okay, chue, you lack of teeth. So he's talking about a guy with no teeth. Wang ni, okay, ni means toddler, sometimes called baby. Wang, of course, that's a common last name, but it also means kid. So I think I see some Western translation translates as a baby kid. Okay, it's funny, but uh, when I read this one, I think. Okay, if you look at the words, you can see uh, Zhuang Zi's uh, humorous here. Okay, uh, he, he put a great master and the student have a di uh, dialect and then have a long speech about all the uh, theoretical foundation. And then right now he put a tooth toothless guy and the baby kid or a toddler kid have a conversation on that. So let's see how does it say. Uh, so this one it directly turned to very Socratic um, uh, epistemological question, right? How do you know what you don't know? What do you know? You something you know, you don't know, this kind of question. So that's a full question he asked, right? He talked about Nie Chue, the toothless guy, asked the, the toddler kid, okay? Do you know in what all things agree? How can I know? That's the answer. Do you know what do you not know? And then the answer is, how can I know? Then do all things have no knowledge? Okay, how can I know? So every answer he doesn't know. But turn out the baby kin or the toddler kin have a long uh, uh, teaching okay, to the toothless. Okay, so he said, how can I how can I know that I say I know may not be really what I do not know? How can I know that what I say I do not know may be really something I know, right? When I say something I know, how, how do you know I really know? When I say something I don't know, I may really know something, right? So everything just what you said is not necessarily represent the right or wrong. And the Seki give some example, and I'm not going to read all this example, but basically he's talking about, well, when, when the people sleep in the damp and the damp place, he have the pen in his waist, right? And then, but the snake has no problem, right? And then um, uh, when you are stay in the high place, you feel frightened. But the monkey doesn't feel this way. 
And then he said, you know, you taste some food is good, but some animal doesn't taste this food is good. But you can see like some people like spicy food. Some people say spicy food is terrible. And even a lot of people eat, uh, uh, especially uh, Chinese, eat something like uh, bitter mound melon, right? A lot of people say, oh, that's a wonderful food. Food is bitter, but you know, some people don't like it. Coffee, some people drink sweet, some people don't want sweet. So people have a different taste. And even talk about the beautiful, he, talk, he used the two Lady Mao Qiang Li Ji. Okay, that's two famous uh, beauties. And then all the, of course, it's a male center. So the, oh, all the male like to look at, you know, like to close to this beauty, but the fish and the birds see the beauty run away. So, uh, so he want to, what he want to say is, um, uh, as I look at this matter, right, the principle of, so he tried to uh, develop the concept of uh, taste good, taste bad, okay, uh, beautiful, ugly. So he want to extend this concept to the moral sense, right? So he talked about, as I look at this matter, the principle of benevolence and the righteousness, basics, these two words, benevolence and the righteousness means morality, right? The way of the right and the wrong are in, in, inextricably mixed and confused. How can I know the difference among them, right? So he start to lead from the, uh, your taste, different taste to your aesthetic taste, beauty and ugly, to the moral as a taste, because that's a different uh, concept, okay, on that. And the true and the false, the truth and the falsity, they have just different standards. How can I know? Then uh, Nie Chie, the toothless guy, keep asking the false question, right? If you do not know what is beneficial and what is harmful, what does this mean to that the perfect man is without this knowledge? So here tied to the third question, talk about everything have no knowledge. So uh, I think the, 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 the concept here is, uh, the question is, uh, does everything have knowledge? The Wang Ni, the Tatar King's answer is no knowledge. Okay, there's depend on who you are, depend on what your position. There's no sense of knowledge, no true knowledge. So Nie Chie, the toothless guy, try to ask, how about the perfect man? Right? Uh, here, perfect man, Zi Ren. Okay, that's you can replace. Uh, with equivalent to Chai, uh, Confucian, talk about Junzi, the gentleman, or the basically it's the role model, talk about even the perfect the situation. Uh, they still have the no knowledge. Okay, no knowledge, that's fine. But at least we have the concept of beneficial and harmful, right? So, on the, because we, we, even we don't care of the true or False. We don't care of the uh, taste. We don't care about the beauty and the art. At least we care about the beneficial and the harmful, right? Otherwise, we cannot survive. So his answer become mysticism, right? It's a mystical answer. He talk about the perfect man is mysterious. Okay, uh, with the great lakes, he talk about even the uh, in in any kind of situation, he is not being harmed. Okay. And then uh, the, he can ramble at ease uh, beyond the sea, neither death or life can affect him. How much there's the consideration about the beneficial and harmful. So he will become a little bit of mysticism because he started to talk about, technically he didn't answer this question put this way. He talked about, uh, that's beyond. If you don't care about the life and the death, being and the non-being, then the beneficial and the harmful is not a question, okay? So he, the toothless person, the toothless guy still stick in the, this world, 
about the beneficial and the harmful. But the toddler kid, Wang Ni, start to tell him, beyond life and the death, the harmful and the beneficial is not what you need to care. That's the answer on the, this question. And here, I think uh, Feng Yulan also draw a conclusion on the whole chapter where he think uh, to this moment, the whole chapter is make a good point here. So the Feng Yulan, the translator, he talk about the truth is that they are equally right and that they, their ways of habitation are equally good. He talk about the example, people live in the place, in a different place. In the same way, although there is an infinite number of differences between things in different aspects, yet all are right and good. Everything is right, everything is good. So are the different opinions in human world. In Zhuangzi's book, the chapter on equality of things, that's this chapter, begin with the interesting story of different noise of wind and the music of earth, as was mentioned above. Okay, that's the first dialogue at the beginning. And all these different noises, different ways of blowing are equally good. The different human opinion are like a different noise of wood. Okay, and just like the singing of birds, they together constitute what we may call the music of man. Of man. They are equally right and equally good. The sage just amuse themselves with this, uh, uh, this uh, variety of opinion, but do not quarrel with them. They simply, the sage, stand at the center of the circle, as Zhuangzi call it, to meet the infinity, uh, infinite uh, variety. And uh, then they let the different opinion along, and uh, they themselves transcend them. This is Zhuang Zi call the take the two courses at once. So I think uh, Feng Yulan make a conclusion here. Okay, from here, uh, that's the attitude Zhuang Zi teach us. We should take. So that's the second dialogue we move here between the two threads, Nie Quan and the, the uh, other kids under right, this conversation. Okay, so question, comment, before we move to the third one. No. Okay, uh, the third dialogue uh, is between Ju Quanzi and Chang Wu Okay, you will see the Zi at the end. So start here, you probably will see, okay, this text, actually in all Zhuangzi's text, it, it, it started with some metaphysical question or some argument. And a lot of time end with some mysticism, okay. So uh, I just mentioned about mysticism in the Western tradition because the Christian belief, okay, she will lead to the revelation and lead to the God's grace. If you will face a lot of philosophers, especially in the uh, Middle Age, talk in the Middle Ages, talk about the faith, grace, depending on you are Catholic or Protestant. Okay, and you will talk about uh, in the Protestant, you will talk about faith. Okay. So in the uh, uh, Catholic side, you talk about revelation. Okay. So in Zhuangzi also have the mystical part. And then later on in the Chinese, most on the southern part of Chinese, Taiwan, become developed as a religious Tao. Okay. So this book sometimes being read as a religious teaching. Okay. So that means they they focus more on the mystical part than on the philosophical part. So the third dialogue, you will see uh, the, the, per, the two dialogues called the Ju Chue Zi and the Chang Wu Zi. Okay, that's a very common Taoist master's name. 
Okay. Yeah. That's a comment. But if you dissect the words, Ju Chetz actually means the magpie. Okay, the bird. Chang Wu Zi means the 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 the, the twig, the long twig. So technically, I put this scene here. Technically, when the author, I assume is Zhuang Zi, write this text, he's talking about this scene, the birds. Singing because if you tie to the beginning, right? He talk about the the the, the music, um, the sound, the, the 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 music of the earth, and then he said the distinction of a human language and the different with the birth song, and then it's very possible when the author write this one, he has this scene in his mind. That's the birds talking. He just interpret, right? So here. The birds, okay, the Ju Chet ask the twig, okay, uh, saying, I heard from the master. Okay, here he said master means Confucius. Okay, okay. the sage, the sage doesn't mean uh, uh, Confucius, the sage means Taoism. Tao is the sage. Okay, so here he's talking about Confucius complain, criticize Taoism. Okay, so the Taoist sage say that. Tao says does, does not occupy himself with affairs of the world. He neither, the Tao is said, he neither seeks gain, he nor avoid injury. Tied to the previous one, okay, it doesn't care the beneficial or harmful. He has no pleasure in seeking. He does not purposely adhere to Tao. Remember, even he is a Taoist sage, he doesn't purposely adhere to Tao. If you do that, you, you get into the right and the true and the false. You obscure the Tao. So he does not purposely adhere to Tao. He speaks without speaking. He does not speak when he speaks. Okay? Thus, he roam beyond the limit of this dusty world, which he means. The dusty world means the secular world, the master. Okay, here we talk about the Confucius consider the Taoist master discretion is the rough discretion. Okay, but I, the, the bird, consider this as a mysterious Tao. How do you think about this, dear sir? Okay, so the birds ask the twig. Okay, that's, uh, that's the Taoist sage teach about this, right? But Confucius rejected, say, oh, that's rough discretion. But I think that's right. Okay, so then the trick, the, 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 the trick answer the question. Okay, so we talk about this one is so deep, deep mystical, even yellow emperor. Okay, so yellow emperor, you can say, is even higher, more ancient in Chinese tradition. More ancient means better. Okay, so even better, like yellow empire. Okay, we got we doesn't really understand. Perfect, get confused about this. How can Confucius understand this? Right. So he want to talk about he means the Twig, Mister Twig. Want to talk about is he want to tie the life and the death since we already ask the this word, the secular word. So you can see how does the religious person will start to take this one on the religious way or mystical way in this way. He started to talk about life and the death. So here he want to tell us is the life death is kind of like a dream and awaken, right? So he want to tie to this one become as our attitude to face because in another way we can say all the philosophical question is teach us how to face death, right? just like uh, uh, Plato's uh, Phaedos, right? How does Socrates face death? Okay, so you need to have something, otherwise one day when you face death, how are you going to do it? So you can see here, how does this uh, dialogue turn into, okay? So the tweak, okay, answer, the long tweak, or you want to call it Chang Wu okay? How do I know that? The love of life is not a delusion. How do I know that he who is afraid of death is not like a man who was away from his home when young and therefore has no intention to return? So he, 
try to use the metaphor of life and the death is a delusion, just like when you leave hometown for a long time and you enjoy the life in America, you forget about the life in Taiwan, like me, and the, you're afraid to go back. And he used Li Ji, the beautiful girl again. Okay, Li Ji was the daughter of the border warden of I. So it's kind of like uh, local governor. Uh, the daughter, beautiful girl, daughter, and uh, the state of Jin, Jin. Okay, here you talk about Jin. Jin is during that time a power, most powerful state. Okay, want to marry her because she is beautiful, and she doesn't want to leave her home. Right? She sweat, she wet until the front part of the robe. So she, he, he, she cried. Okay, and but when she came to the royal residence, she with the king, uh, with his luxury coach. Ate rich food, he regret, she regretted that she had wet. How do I know that the death will not repent of their formal craving for life? So here he started to talk about the life, right? And then he started to talk about life is a great dream. Okay. So uh, here is the talking about the, his speech about. Uh, the life, right? Uh, those who dream of banquet at night may in the next morning wail and uh, weep, right? You dream you have a part, great party. In the morning, you just realize your life is terrible. You start to wail and weep. And those who dream of wailing and the weeping, maybe in the morning, go out to hunt. So here you talk about go out to hunt during that time. Go out to hunt means happy. So when you dream something sad in the dream, but when you wake up, you say, oh, that they have hunting party. So, you know, that's a happy day. So when they dream, they do not know they are dreaming. In their dream, they may even interpret dream. Only when they are awake, they begin to know that they dream. By and by come the great awakening and then we shall find out that the life itself is a great dream. All the while, the fools think that they are awake, that they know. With nice discriminations, they make distinction between prince and grooms, okay, the high ranking and the, uh, the, the neighbor, okay. And how stupid. Confucius and you are both in dream. When I say that you are in a dream, I'm also in a dream. This saying is called a paradox. So here he called it the paradox and he want to keep this paradox. He doesn't want to resolve this paradox. If after 10,000 ages, we could once meet a great sage who knows how to explain it, it would be as if we meet him in a very short time. So here would be in the re become a more religious reading and especially uh, thousand years later when the Buddhism teaching come to China, this one easily being tied to the Buddhism teaching. And that's why, you know, uh, uh, a lot of people today, when they read Zhuangzi, they will, I will say, impose or uh, understand uh, this one is Buddhism teaching. Okay, so you can see how it tied together. All right. So you will say, just like I feel uh, Plato's philosophy, uh, idea of idea and the forms, basic is Christian before uh, Jesus. So this one would be kind of like Buddhism teaching before Buddhism in China. So the tweak, want to give a lesson here. So basically he's talking about, let us forget life. Let us forget the distinction between right and the wrong. Let us take our joy in the realm of infinity and remain there. There, I think he means the paradox. Okay, so forget about everything. So that's the, uh, 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 the trick the Chang Woods try to teach. Um, the birds, the magpie, okay, the lifestyle. So you can see the whole dialogue from now on, it go from uh, 
the language music the Tao is teaching about right and the wrong okay uh, true and the false life and the death okay they gradually draw to the life and the death and the dream and the awake okay so and the gradually from the epistemology question and the question of an uh, epistemological question to touch the metaphysical question and gradually move to the uh, religious question, life and the death. And then since uh, Zhuangzi or the China during that time has no question. So to deal with the mystical question, uh, they use dream as a metaphor, or as a, uh, because there's no church. So use dream as a metaphor to talk about this. So that's the third dialogue, uh, which is short and the dialogue four, even shorter. So uh, I will call for a few minutes. Uh, if you have a question or something you want to talk and then we will finish in the next shot uh, about the, uh, the fourth dialogue and the butterfly tree. Then we probably have some time to discuss. Uh, Madam, please. <clears throat> Mm, thanks, Jason. This is wonderful. It, uh, it seems to me that there is always going to be a relationship between a magpie and a twig. <laughs> and I am wondering if um, in English, the word twig, it can mean one that's either attached to a tree or lying on the ground. So one that's attached to a tree is something that a magpie would perch on. Mm -hmm. So that would be advice it could it could hang on to and stand on. If it's lying on the ground, it is advice or an, or a reply that it could pick up and fly away with. And I'm just wondering if there's a connotation about the type of twig contained in the word in in Chinese. Uh, actually, I'm not aware of this. The words he used here is called wu. Wu is one kind of tree, okay? So I just call it a twig because I will assume that the birds stand on the tree, okay? And then, of course, the oh. birds are going to stand on the twig. It's about birds have to stand on the twig because you cannot stand on the, unless it's a woodpecker, right? Otherwise, you cannot stand on the trunk, right? So I, that's, that's my personal, uh, interpretation because I think uh, it, I assume you will stay on the twig and the word is wu, okay that means one kind of tree so ah okay thank you so you probably overthink okay so <laughs> <laughs> well it, it makes sense I mean that the replies are uh, they're really just about birds and wood yeah I think so that, uh, I, I think so, um, a lot of uh, interpretation uh, probably the Chinese tradition, Chinese scholars are less humorous, okay, <laughs> usually over serious. So probably take this one. I, mean, I think they have a lot of humorous here. So when the Nan Guo Qi Zi speak, he say, in ji er zuo. I, I just, I think the people try to tend to explain as he sit there and uh, lean to the table, have a meditation. But I think that he is sitting under the table, just you know, just have a fun or just lazy or something. I I I think that's this way. But unfortunately, not most of the people see this way. I I see that's the situation. Uh, he's doing. And when we talk about Nie Chue and Wang Ni, and some scholar try to find the Nie Chue is the teacher of. Uh, Xu Yu, who is the sage about, so I, I think the Nie Chue, just look at the words, that means the guy has no teeth, and the, if you look at the words, Wang Ni, that means, or it could be a person called Wang Ni, it could be means a uh, other kin. Then I go to the Ju Chue Zi, that sounds like a Taoist sage, and uh, Chang Wu Zi, that means long tree, long, long wood. Mr. Longwood and the Mr. Uh, Birth, Mr. Megapie. So it's a beautiful word in Chinese, but 
I think it's that probably Zhuang Zi just means that's the birds and that's twig. I hear the birds and twig. They are singing. They are talking. They talk about what they talk. Great thing. They talk, <laughs> Confucius. They talk about. They criticize Confucius. Then they give you a religious reason and a, a teaching. Talk about life and the death. Talk. So you can see the 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 interlocutor. The 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 people who speak get they will get lower and the door, right? So from the Taoist master to the two slaves and the toddler and the, to the birds and to it. So the, the intellectual go lower and the lower, but their uh, subject become more and more serious, okay? So I think so that's the, the, the layout for the entire uh, chapter in the chapter two. That I think I see this layout and I think that's interesting. Yeah, and the, I do see some, I do read some, that's not all by myself. I also, because I also read some other uh, 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 writer talking about this, but not a lot, it's not a, uh, a typical interpretation. Okay, but I think that's the way I see it. And, and when you see the next one, you will see my logic. I'm not saying it's right, but it has a way to, connect everything together. And, and then, so you will see from the Taoist master to student, from the toothless to the toddler, the birds and the woods, and what's next? A shadow and the penumbra, penumbra, right? Penumbra, I think the penumbra means the second shadow, where you see the shadow and then the second shadow. And this one is totally, uh, I will say it's a metaphysical, Question. Okay, so that's the first dialogue, which is very short, only one page. Uh, I see this one as Spinoza's question. Okay, uh, and then later on, I do see Feng Yulan talking about Spinoza on this part. But I will introduce next time. Uh, he he thinks this one as uh, Spinoza's question. Okay, so the text is very short in Chinese. Only has. Uh, 20 words? Okay, not no, very short. Okay. The penumbra ask the shadow. Okay, so it, at this previous dialogue, you still have a bird talk to uh, the, the wood. But right now it's a penum uh, penumbra and the shadow have a conversation. Okay. So at one moment you move, at another you are at rest. At one moment, you sit down, at another, you stand up. Why is this, why this instability of purpose? So I, I, that, that's the way I read it, okay? So uh, I think he, the, the penumbra is complaining about shadow. See, you, you, you stand up, you're just restless, you sit up, you move, you rest, you, you sit up, you stand up. So uh, then I have to follow you. What's your purpose doing? Well, what caused you to do this, right? And then the shadow start to answer. Okay, do I have to depend? He, actually, his answer is a question. Okay, so do I have to depend on something else in order to be what I am? That's a question, okay? Does that something on which I depend still have to depend on something else in order to be what it is? So here he asked the question, I'm not restless. I move because there's something caused me to do something. It does this something have something to cause this? So it's a chain of causation. He's asking this question. Do I have to depend on the scales of snake or the wings of the cicada? So uh, a lot of uh, reader will get confused here about the scales of uh, snake and the wings of cicada. Uh, uh, I think here he talk about very small things. So in our understanding would be butterfly effect, right? If there's some butterfly flipping and then you will affect another thing and even another thing then turn out to work tornado and the disaster and the, the, something big happened. I think he's talking about this, but he put in the question mark, which a little bit confused here. 
So how can I tell why I am so, why I'm not so, not otherwise, right? So here, I think, depend on your answer when he asks the question, the shadow asks the question. If your answer is yes, okay, my behavior is caused by the thing, by the thing. So he probably talking about a deterministic world, right? Which means everything is predetermined. I have no, nothing to do with that. This, everything is mechanical. Okay, if you answer us, no, probably he's talking about it's a spontaneous world and the world is random. There's no cause, everything just spontaneously happen. So either way, I don't know, but at this, he's talking about something, the, this world, there's nothing I can do, either predetermined or just happen spontaneously. So Feng Yolan's comment is taken as answer, uh, that which is same as Guo Xiang, uh, the, uh, the talk about. Say this shows that everything is spontaneously what it is. One need only to follow one's nature and not to ask why one is so and not otherwise. So uh, that's Feng Yolan, and basically it's Guo Xiang's answer on this one too whatever you, your nature, okay? Don't be, uh, uh, try to mimic other people, don't follow the uh, other stage. Uh, 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 thing. So that's this dialogue is talking about. So you can see the dialogue move to a different direction now. And then Zhuang Zi drop the final line. Okay. It's only very short, it's a butterfly dream that he's talking about. So you can see the dialogue for full dialogue right now in the third person describe Zhuangzhou. Zhuangzhou is uh, Zhuangzi's name, right? So once upon a time, okay, I have to mention this text is very important text. I mean, the last sentence because the language is beautiful. So it's being quoted and quoted many times, not only a philo philo philosophical meaning, mostly on the literature and uh, uh, and the religious, okay, people will still talk about this. So this one become important text. So, I mean, this sentence. So once upon a time, Zhuangzhou dreamed that he was a butterfly. A butterfly fly about, enjoying itself. It did not know what, did not know that it was Zhuangzhou. Suddenly he awake and uh, variably was Zhuangzhou again. We do not know where it was Zhuangzhou dreaming that he was a butterfly or whether it was a butterfly dreaming that he was Zhuangzhou. Between Zhuangzhou and the butterfly, there must be some distinction. This is the case, what is called the transformation of thing, Wu Hua. Okay, so I, to this point, I still not sure uh, what Zhuangzi means, Wu Hua here. Okay. And of course, they, if you search for solution, uh, that has a lot of religious uh, solution here, but I do not satisfy with this. I'm still thinking about uh, philosophical interpretation of the transformation of things. Does it mean to transcendent? Does it mean uh, 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 paradox or skepticism? You know, so that, that's another thing we can discuss. So uh, finally, I will read the uh, Feng Yolan and the Guo Xiang's interpretation to this dream and also to the entire chapter. This shows that although in ordinary appearance, there is difference between things. In delusion or in dream, one can be also another. The transformation of things proves that the difference among things are not absolute. In Feng Yolan's concept is that's anti-absolutism, absolutism, that's everything is relative. And, and the Guo Xiang, which in the red text, talk about everything consider itself to be right, other to be wrong, itself to be beautiful and other to be ugly. Everything is what is the opinion of one and the opinion and the other are different. That they both have opinion is the same. So both they have opinion. The same. So 
So we will end this one here. And I think Zhuang Zihe posed a big question. That's why I call it the Spinoza's question, because uh, if you're familiar with Spinoza's metaphysical of ontological, first he is a Moism. Uh, he think about this world is uh, determined, deterministic, but everything is determined. How can I live in this world, right? How can you be still free and happy in this deterministic world? Or you are in this world of the spontaneous world. How can you live in this world? All right. So I think in the next chapter, chapter three, the cultivation of life, probably give a good answer, okay, on the, uh, this question. And another thing, that's my personal reflection when I prepare uh, this uh, chapter. Another thing is the transform transformation of things. I don't know what that means, and I'm not sure it's important or just something, but uh, I want to think about this. What's the transformation of things? Okay, and what's that be? So uh, I will end this one uh, now. Okay, so uh, the presentation now, and then we will have a few minutes we can discuss. And then if you have comment, question, or some idea you want to share, and then please. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Wang. Uh, Madam, please. Well, back in the world of the shadow and the penumbra, uh, it, it seems to be an entirely different uh, interpretation. I mean, it, it seems as if the interpretation is taking the shadow's words to be the true words, when in fact it's laughable to think of a shadow being completely independent of anything else. Okay. <laughs> and the, the penumbra itself, it's the lighter part of the shadow. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the shadow, but it's a lighter part. So now the thing is having a conversation with itself about its independence of something that it's not at all independent of. Um, and the um, it's like listening to a child say, I'm completely independent of my parents. I'm 10 years old. I, I do what I want and I, <laughs> um, you know, it's okay. Um, I thought the examples of the snake scales and the cicada wings were very interesting. Oh, yeah. um, those are both things that are attached to a larger body. They're okay. attached to the larger body of an animal. And furthermore, they're made of a similar substance, um, that'd be the equivalent in an insect and in a, um, in a reptile, be the equivalent of something like our fingernails or our hair. Or, our, or what our eyeballs are made of. I forget what the things are called. Something like keratin. Um, and so those, those are things that are semi-transparent. They'll cast a shadow, but it will be a very faint shadow and it will show the texture of what the thing is. It will show the wing or it will, be, uh, it will show the snake scale. And both the cicada and the snake are transformative animals. Um, the cicada comes out from the ground and it goes through many, many molds. Yeah. Uh, that's when you see those um, exuvium all over the place. And a snake also goes through many molds. Yeah, that's, that's great. You know, and I, I didn't think about this way, you know, uh, but you know, and that, that's the beauty of this uh, text, you know, because uh, uh, yeah, and I, I never think about the transformation of the cicada or the snake or the compare the uh, wings of cicada as the penumbra and the shadow, you know, but that's also interesting uh, comparison, yeah. Uh, CK, please. Yes, yeah, so I would like to comment on the question about the butterfly and Zhuangzi. Okay, please. While walking yesterday, I had a, a eureka moment <laughs> whereby I thought about this question 
And I think, as far as I know, nobody has ever come up with this answer before. Okay. Uh, and it's a rather, rather odd uh, answer. I think I have a solution to his question. Whether it is Zhuang, Zhuangzi, Zhuangzhou dreaming of the butterfly or the butterfly dreaming of Zhuangzhou, I think my answer has to be that it is Zhuangzhou dreaming of the butterfly. Uh, I will tell you the reason or the logic behind my analysis, behind my, my uh, conclusion. When Zhuangzhou is dreaming of the butterfly, he dreams of a butterfly that is flattering its wings, flying in the air, right? So that is the image that we get from the, the text um, that the butterfly is, is flying. So Zhuangzi dreams of a flying butterfly. So for the butterfly to dream of Zhuangzi, the butterfly has to be at a state of rest, meaning it has, if you're <laughs> flapping your wings, you can't be dreaming. It's it's against nature to dream while you are you're, you're flying or, or you know dry, dreaming means you have to be in a state of uh, rest and, and 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 dormancy which the butterfly is not. Therefore, by logical analysis, Zhuangzi is dreaming of the butterfly and the butterfly is not dreaming of Zhuangzi. Thereby, the thousand year question has been solved by me taking a walk. Okay, great. So you probably want to write a paper on this. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I do ask this question, okay, to chat GPT. Okay. And but actually I ask him, tell me a joke about Zhuangzi's butterfly tree. Okay. And I think he gives a very good uh, joke and it's meaningful. I asked Chat GPT. And uh, his answer is he I asked Chat GPT to tell me a joke about this. And the chat GPT said, uh, uh, Zhuangzi asked his friend, am I in a dream or uh, am I a person or, or uh, in the butterfly dream or am I a butterfly in a, a person's dream? And his friend said, I don't know, you know, but only thing I know, in either way, you are Zhuangzi. Okay, so I think that's a little bit of Buddhism thinking here. You had a son. Uh, store consciousness, okay, you through different uh, transformation, you still have a, 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 a thing there. So that's the joke on chat GPT. Okay, so I'd like to share. So uh, we probably will end soon and the question, comment, and the Fred, are you still there? You want to share, how do you think about the fry train? And then... <laughs> No? Okay. That's fine. Okay. Uh, Cardi, please. I really liked for the uh, all four dialogues how there was a progression in um, sort of a dissension from uh, macro thinking to micro thinking and what's serious and what's not serious. And um, I can sort of see the whole theme emerge yeah. and play on itself paradoxically. And to me, that's humorous. I think this is really a great way to look at different ways of thinking through these different characters. Uh, thank you for this comment. And then um, I, I do see this chapter is very difficult. And then until uh, I see divided to four dialogue with one dream, and I start to see the whole logic on that. Okay. So, um, uh, I'm quite happy and uh, very appreciate, you know, and uh, you guys, uh, 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 you listen to me and uh, then you get this benefit. So uh, I think that will help to read. And uh, then for the next chapter, the cultivation of life, the famous story is about Cook Ding, right? The person, the expert uh, chef who cook, uh, who, 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 who cut the, 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 the ox, Okay, so I think he's answering to this one. So I will, but that, that chapter is very short. Okay, so don't worry about like reading. I, I post the, I check the reading in, for, uh, it's only three pages. So it's relatively short. Okay, so it's easy reading and then 
uh, we can have a more relaxed discussion on the chapter three. Uh, Madeline, please. Yes, uh, this is a question about the, I guess the structure of the chapter or the inner chapters. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the eight-legged table exam came along after this. Okay. I'm wondering if you see the roots of that system in this text or maybe even back in Sun Tzu. I don't see the, 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 the root of this no. one. yeah no okay. I, I don't see this one yeah so uh probably i misread it or something i ignore it uh, uh because i have the tendency to that of course that's what like my personal preference i will have a ten i have a tendency to look at the entire chapter and then i don't see each section as uh, Independent, I see they have the relation and the even between chapter and the chapter. Mm -hmm. That's the way I read it because if you don't put the uh, uh, the teaching or the dialogue in the big picture, sometimes it's misunderstood. Is that um is that something that that type of um, eight legged table essay would be uh, similar to? In other words, the structure, not the content. No. no. No, no. Yeah. Okay. structure is very rigid. Okay. Um, well, I will I will say this way. Okay. The ADEC structure, I don't know how does it develop, but it develops much later. And to be honest, the, the ADEC structure is very good structure to write it. Okay. So, but just again, it's for when you have a good tool you can do a lot of good things, but in the same time, you've been limited by this tool. That, that, that's what I have to say, you know. And the ADEC uh, uh, structure basically is developed much later time. And I don't see they have the same root of this one. And then you probably want to say, because Jason, my, my, my fault, because I know ADEC structure, then I impose this ADEC to the, uh, uh, Zhuangzi's reading and every single reading, even when I read the Plato's, I impose the ADEC structure on it. Uh, you may say this, yeah, but I will deny it. But who knows, you know, probably, you know, I unconsciously, you know, which of course I deny and I did that, but probably I did that, you know, unconsciously, you know, that's the part I. I cannot admit since it's unconscious. So uh, uh, it's possible. Okay. So, uh, but we can talk about ADEC one day at a time, I think. And uh, I spend a lot of time playing with ChatGPT. And I do find out the ChatGPT probably very, uh, the, the, the way they answer the question is kind of follow the structure. And I believe if uh, ask them to pass the royal exam in China, uh, in the ancient Chinese uh, royal exam, they could do a good job because there's very structures and everything is well balanced. So uh, I try to stay away on that, but anyway, that's it. So, okay, uh, we will end now. And then thank you very much. And then uh, uh, next week we talk about mentions to so give everyone a break and then in, then we talk about Hindus, and then in June, we'll come back for the chapter three. All right, thank you everyone. And chapter three is a shorter one. So if you find it's too difficult for uh, this chapter, and then chapter three is easy read. Thank you, and see you next week. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Good night. Bye. -bye.